Mike in Indio, California, listening on Sirius Satellite Radio, Sirius XM. Hey, Mike, what's up? Hey, Tom, really appreciate your uh, program. I'm a registered professional chemical engineer with a 35-year career in California and Texas, and currently uh, involved in uh, um, mining lithium from geothermal brines. I think you've talked before. Uh, but I wanted to make sure that in the conversation about the carbon tax, really what we need to be doing is charging energy producers for the real cost of their energy. And as you point out, the cost of the waste uh, that uh, the uh, petroleum industry is putting out. But there's one thing that I'm, I'm very concerned about, and that is the Obama administration seems to be cuddling up to the nuclear industry mm -hmm. uh, because it doesn't have carbon emissions. And that is a very, very dangerous thing to do. I uh, was involved in the uh, Diablo Canyon protests back in the 70s with uh, Jackson Brown. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm thrilled to see that the San Onofre plant is being uh, mothballed and, and that PG&E or Southern California Edison is no longer going to be operating that plant. But there are so many better solutions yeah. for us. I agree, Mike. Um, and, and, and this has been, I mean, you know, again, no, no president is perfect, no politician is perfect, and to even fantasize about such a thing is probably a big mistake. Uh, president oh, Obama sure. has, uh, even back to his days in the state Senate in Illinois, always been a supporter of nuclear power. And I think it's because a lot of the electricity produced in Illinois is from nuclear power, and they've probably been supporters of his. Um, you know, I'm, I'm putting the most cynical spin on it, but I'm guessing that that's what it is. That's how politics works. The fact of the matter is that nuclear power plants actually do create enormous carbon dioxide emissions. They don't do it by fission. They don't do it in the process of, of you know, boiling water for the reactor. They do it instead through the process using fossil fuels of grinding up hundreds of thousands of tons of, of earth to extract a few tons of uranium and then transporting that uranium and that, that it consumes enormous amounts of fossil fuel, and then transporting that uranium to processing facilities which run on, on uh, power generated by fossil fuels and refining that down to fissionable levels of uranium, you know, concentrating it down to below 3%, and then, and then transporting that to the nuclear power plants and then, and then keeping that, uh, you know, after the nuclear power plants are decommissioned, keeping those core materials and waste materials cool for thousands of years, um, you know, assuming that we're still using fossil fuels into the future. And, and the enormous amounts of concrete that go into the construction of nuclear power plants, a lot of, of uh, uh, mostly coal is burned to make uh, concrete. And so yeah, well, the, I, my understanding is that a, fo that, a, that a nuclear power plant doesn't start producing carbon-free energy until around its 8th to 10th year. Yeah, that's, uh, when... When we do uh, projects within our industry, we look at the total cost, right. you know, from, uh, you know, design through construction, operation, and dismantling of a plant. Right, because you have to pay uh, to dispose of your waste. Yeah. Now, you know, I did want to propose, and, uh, you know, I don't want to seem like I'm off on the fringe, but uh, um, there is a solution to our energy problem. And if we had a Manhattan or Apollo-style project to tap the Gulf Stream off of our eastern seaboard, there is more energy out there than we can possibly use. And it is a uh, flow that is the, what is called the Coriolis flow. Mm -hmm. And technically, you're tapping the rotation of our planet. That's right. And that is a flow of energy that can be used to generate electricity directly, brought to the eastern seaboard, put into the grid, used to hydrolyze water into hydrogen for a hydrogen economy, um, fuel cells for electric cars, uh, high-speed rail. Uh, you know, it, it just blows my mind that such an obvious solution, and this is not, you know, this is not something that uh, isn't mechanically engineered, I mean, feasible from a mechanical engineering standpoint. As a matter right. of fact, you know, you'd end up using some of the undersea uh, oil rig technology that we've got, the wind energy uh, turbine mm. uh, um, uh, industry is well established and could be adapted to that energy production use. Um, it just blows my mind that, that uh, the uh, 
the powers that be, the oil companies and our politicians, uh, refuse to look at real solutions. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And, and to, two thoughts on that. Number one, yes, we could harvest energy from the Gulf Stream. And uh, it would be, and, and it is using the power of the spinning of the planet. We could also har harness energy from the rotation of the moon around the planet, which would be our wave and tidal energy. You know, just platforms going up and down on poles following the, t the tides and the waves and, and you know, make the, make the, the platform a giant uh, coil and the pole a magnet and boom, you've got a, an electromagnet, you've got a generator. And, uh, but here's the other thing, the, a cautionary note about the Gulf Stream. If the Arctic, excuse me, if the Greenland ice shelf melts with sufficient rapidity, with fast enough, it will dilute and cool the northern Atlantic waters to the point where the Gulf Stream, which originates um, thousands of miles out in the Pacific Ocean, and uh, you know where there's this giant upwelling and and uh, this is warm area in the in the center of the uh, of the Pacific, and then goes at, the, at more or less the surface, goes down underneath the coast of Africa, South Africa, loops around, comes up to the, to the east coast of the United States, goes up the east coast for a ways, and then, and then out in the middle of the Atlantic, just a couple hundred miles south of Greenland, it, it, there's like basically a giant whirlpool. I mean, you can actually, see, you know, there's photos of ships actually, there's cer certain times of the year you can actually see the dent in the surface of the ocean because it's hundreds of millions of gallons of water falling from the surface down to the bottom of the ocean where it then f traces the same circuit all the way back out to the Pacific at, the, at sea level. And the heat that it releases, uh, which causes it to cool and fall, this is called thermohaline circulation. I'm sure you know this. The heat that it releases is the reason why the, the why Europe, why France, which is at the latitude of northern Michigan, has the climate of Tennessee. And you know, and and if that Gulf Stream were to stop, then then Europe would be thrown into at the very least a perpetual winter, and at the worst, another ice age. And the evidence is quite strong that if the Greenland ice shelf melts, it will stop the Gulf Stream. So there's a cautionary tale for you, Mike. I, I, I find that hard to believe, given the forces of the rotating planet and uh, the conservation of momentum issues with the Coriolis force. But uh, check it out. Um, there, I, you know, there would be other currents that would be established, but that particular current it depends on the salinity and the temperature of the water at that particular latitude. And that, if that changes dramatically, I mean, it, it'll it'll happen someplace else, but it won't happen there. So, and, and I can tell you, the Europeans are very, very concerned about this. There was a kind of campy Hollywood movie made about it called The Day the Earth Stood Still, and it's based on that science. Mike, thanks for the call.